Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Maurice Bookbinder. Uh, Dr. Horst Sievert and the panelists will be joining us uh, in this excellent uh, planned session. Uh, we are going to be beginning with inviting Thierry Lefebvre to come up and give his uh, discussion that he should have done a couple of, but he was working at the hospital center. So Thierry, welcome again. Thank you, Maurice and uh, host and distinguished uh, panelists. Uh, uh, my talk is how minimalist can we become for performing uh, TAVI. So maybe you remember the first case of uh, Alain Cribier and uh, his idea was to do a TAVI like uh, a PCI procedure. And maybe you don't know, but this case, the first case, compassionate case, was done on conscious sedation uh, uh, with a surgical cut down and without a TEE. 15 years later, uh, the new recommendation of the ESC said that uh, we should move to intermediate risk patient in patient older than 75 um, when the femoral uh, access is uh, suitable uh, according to uh, uh, our team discussion. So now I think it's time to uh, move to uh, simplicity because simplicity is a uh, ultimate sophistication. And we learn from uh, uh, this uh, very uh, well-known guy that uh, everything should be made as simple as possible. It's true for physics, mathematics, but also for medicine, uh, but not simpler. So uh, general anesthesia was associated with a lot of uh, problems, especially hemodynamic instability. So we moved to uh, conscious sedation in 2009. And as you know, there is now a lot of meta-analysis. This is the most recent one showing a, a low rate of death when you use conscious sedation as compared to general anesthesia, uh, but also a shorter length of stay, uh, lower need for catecholamine, uh, lower need for catecholamine after the procedure, lower transfusion rate, probably because of uh, low pressure of the patient, and uh, uh, there was a higher risk of uh, pneumonia uh, when you are using conscious sedation instead of uh, general anesthesia, uh, general anesthesia instead of conscious sedation. Of course, this was associated with too much monitoring, uh, which was uh, simplified, removing uh, TEE uh, using TTE since 2009 in my center, only two venous lines, and probably will move to only one. <coughs> the main exercise complication was also a big problem at the very beginning because of uh, large French uh, guiding catheters. Uh, so, progressively, uh, we dec the, this decreased dramatically uh, because of better preprocedural screening. We moved from uh, a surgical cut down to a prostar, then to two proglides. And of course, at the same time, there was a downsizing from 24 French progressively to 14 French. And uh, in parallel, we developed a peripheral intervention toolbox, uh, which is uh, now uh, very useful. Uh, we learn also that uh, major vascular complications may, may be related to the secondary access, so the contralateral femoral access, 35% uh, in this uh, study. Uh, so we decide to move to uh, the radial approach as a contralateral approach, and we developed a special kit for using that with uh, very long balloons, 200, and very long uh, sheaths that can be used through the femoral, uh, through the radial access, uh, even for stenting but not for using uh, 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 covered stents. But now it's very rare. Predilatation is associated with uh, aortic regurgitation in one to two percent of cases, and sometimes it's a dramatic uh, uh, event. Uh, it could be associated with uh, higher risk of AV block, stroke, and of course, because uh, when you predilate, the valve during deployment is less stable, stable in the calcified valve. So we moved to no predilatation in 2014 in the majority of cases. Temporary pacemaker is associated with uh, uh, some problems too, and uh, we moved in 2015 to the use of uh, left ventricular wire for stimulation. Uh, it's a very simple approach using this uh, uh, crocodile uh, connection and uh, maximum intensity and uh, minimum detection and you have a very uh, stable uh, stimulation, even more stable than uh, uh, what we were used uh, before. 
Uh, acute kidney injury is still a problem and uh, we uh, modified our strategy uh, by uh, uh, having a, a, a first uh, an hospitalization, a short hospitalization for screening and then doing the procedure one or two weeks later. Uh, patient preparation uh, by removing uh, 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 contrast uh, toxic agents, uh, dilution of contrast media with saline, use of renal guard in patients who have uh, poor renal function, and of course, use of the MSCT, which is done during the screening, to uh, uh, define what will be the optimal view for deployment, uh, positioning and deployment of the valve. So uh, by doing that, you simply re re decrease the amount of contrast media uh, by uh, 10 to 30 cc. Uh, the rare complication, like annulus rupture, left ventricular perforation, coronary occlusion, and PVL now are very rare, less than 1%. Uh, and uh, of course, thanks to MSCT, we are able to uh, uh, have an optimal sizing, uh, optimal prevention of coronary uh, uh, occlusion, and uh, optimal sizing for preventing uh, a parvalvular leak. Uh, now uh, we have also modified the uh, DAPT pre and post, so we don't use DAPT before except in patients who have a coronary uh, disease and stents. And we g give a DAPT uh, post-procedure only for one month, uh, usually removing aspirin or uh, Plavix after one month. Of course, in patients who had a, a stent recently, we give DAPT for three to six months, and no DAPT in patients who are on anticoagulation because of atrial fibrillation or other indications. And of course, if there is a stent, then we adapt to the patient a la carte uh, using a, a triple association or sometimes a double association like in the worst uh, study. Of course, this uh, may help to decrease uh, hospital stay. This is the experience in Rouen, you see from 2009 to 2013. Uh, it's decreased by five days uh, uh, total hospital duration. So this was uh, five years ago. Uh, in 2015, it was even uh, better, and uh, I think now the mean hospital stay is around 3.5 uh, in Rouen. So if I come back to uh, our story in, uh, in my hospital, uh, you, we start in 2006. You see at that time we are doing one case a month. In 2007, we are do, doing uh, 44 case, cases a month. And you can see that we were only one operator interventionalist and one surgeon, and progressively it increased the number of people who were able to do TAVI. We started to have one fellow in 2005, it, uh, nine, it was uh, Kentawa Yoshida, and now we have uh, two fellows in charge of the uh, TAVI program. And of course, we moved from surgical closure to ProStar, then to ProGlide, general anesthesia, uh, uh, moved to all patients, neuroleptic analgesia in 2009 also, and TE moved to TTE uh, thanks to the use of uh, systematic use of MSCT. Uh, we start with uh, Sapiens 3. The Corval was introduced in uh, 2009. Then we moved to one month of the APT in 2014. Then the left ventricular wire stimulation, radial approach, and uh, and probably we continue to simplify the procedure. So why should we make it simple and not simpler? Because you uh, shorter the procedural time. So today uh, it's less than one hour. Uh, we have less complications related to the aggressivity of the procedure, better patient comfort, uh, a decrease of the uh, intensive care unit stay and the total hospital stay. You decrease also the staff uh, workload uh, you may improve the midterm outcome and you lower the cost for the hospital and for the, the country. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Terry, very much. Uh, it's clearly uh, a, an evolving field. Any questions uh, awaiting to hear whether they're ready in the lab or not? They are ready? Okay, so maybe uh, if somebody has any question, talk to Terry, and thank you very much again for the talk. All right, so you're on. Yeah, hi. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi. <laughs>
Hi, I'm Dr. Ang. My left, yeah. right side is uh, Dr. Hayashida. Hi. Maybe everybody knows who he is. <laughs> so, this is my fellow. Thank you. So, uh, the, I'd like to introduce the, 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 my live second case. This is an 86-year-old male uh, with admitted with a dyspnea, had a history of asthma, echo showed a severe degenerative AS with a normal uh, ejection fraction. Next. A state score is 3.8. Next. So echo showed the normal ejection fraction, peak pressure gradient 88, mean pressure gradient 56, altitude valve area is 0.46. Next. So this is uh, the annulus view. Annulus diameter is uh, Actually, this is bicus. This patient has a bicus speed type zero type zero, zero. bicus valve. Short diameter is twenty three, long diameter is twenty five. Annulus mean diameter is twenty four. Annulus area is four four eight. <coughs> Next, science for salva is in upper large. Long diameter twenty six, short diameter twenty six. Ah, thirty six. Short diameter twenty six. SC junction is twenty eight. Next, LVOT is uh, adequate. Next, so this is by cusp arctic valve. Calcium is uh, 300, the mean uh, median value of our hospital uh, experience. <coughs> next, next, coronary height is more than 10 millimeter. It's good. Next, so this is a sizing chart based on the area over size. 23 undersize, 26, 15% oversize, 29, 44%. I think no choice. <laughs> <laughs> Do you agree? Do yep. agree? Yeah, 20, 26. <laughs> we have to select the 26 subpin V. So, Dr. Dr. An, uh, you skipped yeah. over the uh, cardiac catheterization. Oh, here we go. Did you, did, no coronary disease? Yeah, no coronary disease. Okay. Based on the CT finding, no disease. Okay. No coronary angiography, just CT? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, just CT. Is that what you usually do? Yeah. So coronary CT is normal. We just take one picture before tower. This patient is completely normal. I reviewed the coronary angiogram, so I, didn't, I don't like to take a coronary angiogram mm -hmm. this time. So maybe we could talk for one second about the bicuspid nature of this valve. Yeah. Yeah, right. Because is I think the, the sizing uh, depends greatly on whether you think it is a true bicuspid, functional bicuspid, would you do annular or slightly above annular uh, measurements. This has been the trends that have been talking about. Anybody on the panel and yourself, what, what, what do you think the, the true uh, measurements should be? So is it the annular so, or is it slightly above, four millimeter above? First of all, I'd like, I like to ask you to the panel, the, what's your favorite uh, valve in case of uh, treatment of uh, bicuspid valve? So, first? Yeah, for me it's self-expanding, but it's also for tricuspid valves self-expanding. So, uh, at, this, <laughs> yeah, so at this supra annular measurement, I'm aware of this for the self-expanding. I don't know whether Sapien is also uh, should adjust to the supraannular diameter. There has been a move afoot of measurement of the true, uh, because it's, w it's where the valve is going to be really landing, and it's not the same as the annular with the tricuspid. So if you do a theoretical modeling about four millimeter above for both, you could maybe be able to get a better idea of uh, which is the appropriate valve, especially when you have a liner uh, measurement and in order to mitigate against the paravalvular leak, which is really the, the issue here, not stability. So with the self-expanding, we also undersize the valve compared to the annulus because we rely on the anchoring on the leaflets. So you're doing it uh, innately without necessarily having, this is kind of like yeah. your gestalt. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else, Dr. Howard, anybody else? No, I, I think when you, when you go for the sapien here, probably you should go four millimeters higher which is the common sense as we do it today um, I'm a little bit on horse side um, I'm a little bit more in favor of doing a self expandable valve which has the option of uh, repositioning it if, if you're not fine to give you a little bit more of uh, safety aspect yeah 
Uh, so what, what are you going to do? So, you know, we don't want to take okay. too much of your time. Okay. okay. So Dr. Hayashida, you may have a huge experience, a huge experience, a huge number of experience with Sapien 3 and I think just by like Cosa Alfred as well. So what is your preference? How to decide uh, S3? Maybe different from Everest <coughs> R. How to decide uh, the size selection for S3 in Bicus Valve. Okay. Thank you very much. Actually, the uh, Sapien 3 provides a better ceiling for the case of Bicus case. And as far as the, uh, it is safe, I would like to choose Sapien 3. And if the patient have too small annulus or too heavy calcification, or if there is some very dangerous LVOT calcification or something, okay, okay. I would use the ability dog. Yes, here, here it, the, the calcification is not really a, a huge problem, at least from what was seen on the CT. And the measurements at the annular level is pretty much comfortable, it's not very small. So clearly either of those two valves can be, can be used and it's a matter of uh, experience and what matter of comfort. Uh, anybody else? Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Maurice, I think you're right about the calc calcification because I think this is a unique case of bicuspid valve. A very uh, uh, elder, elderly patient, but the calcification is not that much. Exactly. What what would we usually face uh, with with is a, is a, a very tight and calcified bicuspid valve, and in those situation, you have to think about the asymmetry of the long and short axis. So, using a balloon expandable one, you have to think about rupturing structure, <coughs> causing a lot of paravascular leak. So, uh, in my opinion, generally, a uh, heavily calcified bicuspid, probably self-expanding one is better. But I think for this particular case, maybe uh, CPN is also a good idea. Yeah, I, t I totally agree with you, and that's how we do it, is because with, with those parameters, we start exactly like Dr. Howdy and, and uh, Horst mentioned, that we start with the self-expanding in those heavily calcified and borderline sizing, and then move to another in case there is uh, too much leak before full deployment and release? Actually, we, are, we are, uh, use a CPM valve for the bicuspid things at 205. We never use self-explainable, but actually it's not really, I think as sinus or sour is, is large enough, I don't think it is an issue for the, for the ruptures. Mm -hmm. And uh, for this patient, I, I saw that there's a 15% of oversight for S3. Do you think it's a, it's a little bit too much? 50, uh, he measured it at 400, and so that he said 15, one five. Yeah, 15 percent oversized yeah. no, for the so. valve. For the S3, I think that's a little bit too yeah. too big for me. Uh, if I choose, I will probably will reduce the volume a little bit because the 15 percent mm. for S3, I saw the a little bit over. Yeah, I think I too much. Yeah, I hear you. I, I think personally, because of what we just mentioned about the the, the bicuspid <coughs> nature and the lack of uh, severe. Uh, calcification, I think 15% seemed to be okay. Um, but so actually, the uh, Jim pointed a very uh, important point. And uh, 15 per we don't need the 15% uh, for this case, so that's why we are now planning to reduce the 1 and 2 cc yeah. from the syringe. Initially, I should say, and I implained that 15% uh, may be too much, so the initially we reduced the volume, 1 or 2 cc. <coughs> Did anybody in the room who is sapien user ever measure the difference of one cc? What is, what is the change in diameter if you reduce the amount of uh, how much does it make? One Wait. cc. Yeah, it's been done. And how much is it? One cc is. Well, between one and yeah, I mean the usual is one to two ccs is what you play above or below. Yeah, and that changes the diameter. Uh, by <laughs> two. Hmm? In, vi in vitro. Now, in vivo, it's a completely different uh, translation, and I think it doesn't really, you know, it's very hard to know. Ah, but okay. the in vivo specs is that it changes by one millimeter. Okay. <clears throat> That's in the in vitro. So tell us what your usual, so you have the pigtail in the uh, right coronary, and you are trying yeah. with the amplats and yeah. a straight wire. Yep. And now uh, Dr. has changed the cancer from M plus 1 to one M, plus M plus 2. two. Okay. M plus 1 is not working, so mm. I changed to the M plus 2. Maybe and the opening is very eccentric in case of icosmotic bell. Yep. Sometimes uh, uh, it takes time more. more. Sure. <coughs> yeah. yeah. Exactly. And, and this and is the... Uh, uh, please. Go ahead, please. 
Actually, the uh, the case with bicuspid valve tends to have the dilated SNK aorta, so uh, sometimes I think N plus two uh, works much better than N plus one, but also it depends on the case. Yeah, it depends on how big the aorta and uh, whether it's an eccentric jet from the posterior or anterior. So many, uh, and the wire is it is it straight wire? Yeah, yeah. it's a straight wire. No hydrophilic three. Yeah, five. no hydrophilic. Right. So you start with the straight, straight and then you gravitate. Yeah. Kentaro, Kentaro, yes. you, you used to use uh, JR4 for this, right? Uh, exactly. But the, uh, for this kind of case with a dilated ascending aorta, I, maybe I start from N plus 2. And Dr. Tang has nicely crossed the uh, aortic valve. Do you, do you still uh, do pre-dilatation or you don't? Yeah, I think the, the, the most case is the pre-dilatation in the debatable, but I think the bicuspid aortic valve, we have to pre dilate dilated. Yep. How much heparin do you give? And do you check ACT or just uh, fix those? Initially, we, we, we will check the uh, ACT. Fixed dose is 100, 100 kg you? per minute, uh, kg per kilogram. Please, uh, pick a tail, please. What this kind is of wire is that? This is a valve and uh, this the is a valve wire. is uh, so tight, less than a point of five. Oh, it's uh, too tight, so the predilation is that's, in this. That's correct. Would you like to pick this? And the, patient, pick is, uh, and the mm -hmm. patient is under uh, ma uh, conscious sedation or? Yes, conscious yeah. sedation. With anesthesia administering conscious sedation? Yeah. What kind of wire is that? <laughs> safari wire. Safari wire. No, no. Do you and like that curve? The, it's a little bit, no, ma so <laughs> it's a little bit mangled like. safari, yeah? Yeah, the I don't like. The, uh, so putting the picnic I, I'm inserting the pigtail catheter to make a good shape. And this is the extra small safari? Okay. Mm. It seems to be... Yeah. Yes, this is extra steep. No, the shape is the much better. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's okay. And small curve? Yes, extra small. Yeah, small curve. Yeah. Please show us uh, the ECG and the hemodynamics and the screening. Now we have the uh, blood pressure of 90 over 90. Good. And, and while you're working, you measure, uh, you, so if you're going to do pre dilatation, uh, you do yeah. the balloon selection based on the LVOT, or how do you do the balloon selection? Uh, usual, my preference is a smaller volume to don't damage it to the outer or outer root. So because what do you use? 18? 20. 20. This is 20, yeah. Okay. Yeah, what, so how we do it, I don't know Hurst how you do it, uh, but we, we look at the uh, minimum and maximum of the LVOT and then try to go minus that, always being on, on, on the minimum axis rather than the major axis. How do you do that? We don't predilate. You don't predilate. No. Even in bacuspid, okay. calcified bacuspid. Okay, that's a different story. Yeah, there we predilate, and okay. then I go about actually a smaller balloon. So uh, in this, what is the uh, the patient on? Patient on. I would use a twenty. <laughs> yeah, inflation, inflation, please. Here you see. Wow. Contrasted. Contrasted. Depolation. Depolation. Facing off. Facing off. And the contrast is for doing what? To check the coron first the coronary, but coronary is good. Yeah. And in addition, some parabell leakage to check. So you don't rely on the CT measurements only for height? You do it all the time? Yeah. No. I trust my CT measurement, oh. but uh, this is a, a kind of final check. I see. <laughs> So, Jimmy, can so we review don't the uh, finding uh, by angiogram? Mm -hmm. Can show us the, the uh, yeah, okay. angiogram during the uh, predilation? We would like to uh, search the for uh, the yeah, movement the of the calcium. Yeah. And, and because of this bicuspid anatomy, sometimes the uh, coronary ostium is less predictable than the tricuspid situation. But, but do you really think this angiogram in 2D uh, tells you the story? We don't see that much research. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think 
If it's done for sizing yourself, I can understand it. But to predict exactly it's where it is. Sometimes it's uh, it, it, But then you can, uh, if, if you pay attention, you can appreciate that chunk of calcium is being pushed upward. I mean, so I think uh, this is still a critical step, just to confirm that the corneal osteums is not going to be covered. So you see that chunk of calcium moving upward? Yeah. Yeah, I, must, I must admit that once we have uh, capacious sinuses and yeah. the height is okay, Actually, when you look at this, this angle there, you nicely see the left coronary artery, but I don't see the right one. No. It's gone. So, so, so do you do that? Did you, you do angle? Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, perfect. In, in, not every, in every case. In, in case where we have a very low uptake yeah. of the, of the yeah. coronaries yeah. that we do. But the question right now is if you see this here, you're going to continue with, this, uh, with the balloon expandable valve now? So I see it's not yep. So actually, we discussed about the size of the valve. And according Wire. to the finding of the uh, angiogram, yeah. we don't see that much regurgitation, and that's why we decided to remove the uh, 2cc from 26 millimeter valve. What do you think? Well, the question was the right coronary artery, yeah. because yeah. that seems okay. to be yeah. occluded by the balloon, yeah. the right coronary. But the ICA okay. is uh, more than uh, 13, yeah, I think so based okay. on the, yeah, based on the, yeah. the uh, project CT, so... Also, I Maybe think that the like sizing the based on the, on the uh, stoppage of the leaking can be misleading because uh, sometimes the smaller balloon will seal the, Could you uh, will yeah. seal yeah. The, yeah. The, the, the gap anyway, That's so probably uh, it can underestimate the size. That's why we don't do it, is not to get confused. According to the CT scan, the uh, right corner, uh, please go ahead. I think a balloon is not really for the size in, in, in oh. by a cuspid valve here. Hmm? As, uh, as for me, I, I sometimes I do do it. Yeah. It's mainly for, for look at the, actually the sinus wasawa space. If you have sinus wasawa, good space with balloon, so you can, you can ch choose a large size, like you don't need to reduce it. If you use sinus is really full and you have to reduce it more. That's the one thing I do if really calcified by, by a cuspid valve. Yeah. Could, you Could you go back to yeah. the uh, perpendicular? Yeah. So it looked like it crossed nice, and you had it flexed. It look, looks nice, and then the adjustment now. How so? You're going to keep stay, staying the same thing. You're going to do 80, 80 20 or you're going to do ninety ten. Uh, just a ten, a fifty fifty. Fifty fifty. <laughs> Test it, please. Test it. Yeah. So we, we have we have gone to oh, try okay. to do the ninety ten in the bicus in the true bicuspid where it's not a lot of calcification. Yeah, to go along with that supraannular uh, leaflet okay, tunnel I holding. Yeah. 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 So I think it, it helps a little bit with the regurgitation. Okay. First. Again, so so I don't use the sapien, but when you situation. tell me 50 50 is okay, okay. and 90 10 is okay, then I, my take home message it doesn't really matter. Test it. Well, uh, they Maybe do it 50 50. No. Yeah. But uh, okay. kind of there is, is a move of foot to be like Test we discussed it. earlier, measuring four millimeter above. Okay. So if you if you believe in ready, that, ready. 90, 20, 90, 10 is okay. Facing on. Facing on. Faster. Faster. Inflation, please. Okay. Yes. More faster. Increase. Increase. Sure. Increase. Sure. So yeah. Sure. Sure. See his initial one, fifty-two, three, three four, less. five. Now it's 90 to 10. No? You see it Pace. now is becoming 90 to 10. Pacing off. So yeah. the, that's how exactly it happens. In bicuspid more so. That's a very nice demonstration of how it kind of is designed to move in a ventricular uh, to, to the cephalad and it ends up being almost 80, 20, 90, 10. So, but Maurice, would you have started higher then? I, I would have, if, if this is a calcified uh, by cuspid, probably yes. And you are not afraid, I mean, looking at these scenario Ready? now. Ready? Yeah. We, we do it from the top, not from looking at the bottom. See, there's a little bit of AI. Here. Some, Some AI, AI. Okay. Yeah. right? Is this enter or probably do, could you? Do you want to see echo? Yeah. yeah. So what? you have a, a, a TTE -T -T and no TEE, correct? Yeah, no TEE. Because the conscious sedation. Yeah. 
so sometimes if you if you switch that stiff wire into a pigtail, you can reduce some of the central jets. Yeah, but let's see how let's see whether it's central or paravalvular. This is kind of like a lot for central only. So this is where I personally like to have general anesthesia and TEE in these cases where it is a true bicuspid and not high, highly calcified that the AR is an issue. Uh, the rest of the panelists, uh, any thought about that? I mean, we have to tailor it to the situation. Uh, we have enough for room for, yes, yeah, yeah, for the occurrence there. Uh, I, I, would, I, would, I would go away and uh, change the wire, putting a pigtail in there. First of all, look at the gradient and then see whether angiographically we have less um, paravalvular leakage there. Um, if it's the case, it's them. easy to rewire. Yeah, the only thing with this kind of valve is you don't want to have it embolized during these kind of procedures if it's not well fixed. This one looks well fixed and usually in the big bicuspid, but it is well fixed. Yeah. And I was trying to ask a little bit ahead of time as they're working. I know the minimalistic approach we heard about is very appropriate, but do we tailor, should we tailor our approach to, to the, the situation, not just I do all minimalistic, I back do all consultation. This type of back case to maybe benefits from just TVE. TVE. Especially now that you're going to try to figure out whether the leak is paravalvular, is it central, how much of each in order to optimize the result. Actually, your sinus is so big and the yeah. position... I mean, you you nice. usually have all your measurements up front what kind of options therapeutically you have. Well, um, you can post dilate it. That's yeah, the only I, thing to do. Yeah, I think that what, if I heard it correctly, they put two CC minus. Two CC. So yeah, they don't have it. Two CC. I think so uh, just a minor primary location. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Two CC plus, please. Two yeah, CC. So that would yeah. be starting with two CC uh, minus. So to begin with, I would have not yeah, done I'd that. My PBM. Yeah. Okay. You like to add the... Sure. Okay. Did you, did you, uh, am I correct that you do 2cc minus on the 26? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so then now, now add a 2cc. Yeah. And no. So that's the first thing. But if you had the TEE, you would know whether it's paravalvular or central or where. So adding the 2ccs would be even easier to, to understand. But first thing, okay. that's what I would do is add the 2cc back. Facing on. Inflation. <laughs> okay. One. And so what? Three, and so what do you four, think is wrong? Five. Inflation. Paging off. So are you considering changing the wire with a pigtail to, to make less of a, if it is central or partly central, to take it away? Okay, just the one. I like the wire. The wire is the, uh, yeah. central. And then take a picture. Take an angel uh, autogram again. Yeah. Ready? Ready. Yeah. Okay. I think uh, yep. it's, it's good. Mm. So, I will remove the wire. Why not over a pigtail? Oh. No. Ah, you just pull back. Yeah, just a pull back. Okay, so, so. maybe we could do the uh, angio in a couple of views. What does the, uh, and what does the uh, TTE show? Uh, just a mild parabellar leakage. You mean even after yeah. post-dilatation? RAO, please. Okay. Yeah, a couple of views and it will be... This is the audio view. Yep. Okay. How, how much injection? 20 cc. Yep. It's I pretty think good. This is mm -hmm. less than mild. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Yeah. Do you see the right coronary? Yeah. yeah. It should uh, yeah. be just above. I was about to ask because uh, the right coronary is not filling up very nicely. Not at all. Is there any ECG change? No ECG change. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so. I think the RCA is not, RCA yeah. is no problem. I think the left side is the huge dominant at the initial chrome end. Look at, RCA is a huge dominant. Our uh, left side is the dominant. So complex is very big. Yeah, so RCA is small. Yeah, yeah. Even though RCA occlusion, I don't care. 
That, that's why it is always nice, in my opinion, to do a quick shot and not rely only on the CT for the angiogram. Yeah. That's why I was asking. We yeah. had this problem uh, once, not too long ago, and uh, there was a lot of effort done to try to rescue the right, and it was a non-dominant <laughs> right. <laughs> really? Yeah. The first shot showed that the left is not complex, it's very dominant, yep. and this shot clearly mm. demonstrated well, the, the complex dominance. I think so. I could see, I don't know whether it's optimistic thinking, but I think I could see behind the stent struts, I could see the... In the, okay. of the right coming, it's, a, it's an aberrant takeoff of the right. Okay, I think coronary is no problem. Mm. The, that looks, our, yes, the our, is our message, uh, this, ca uh, this case, the message is if I cost the valve, could it be treated by sub pain 3? Exactly. So, in this case, don't do oversize too much. Start with the nominal or slightly undersized, mm. and then check the autogram. Probably the case is significant, then nominal or a little bit oversized. Yep. This is, well, I think, the safe way. And then, step the inflation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in addition, Sapin 3 is more effective to prevent the parabolic liquid than the Everwood R. I think in the selective case, Sapin 3 would be a good option for bypass the arctic variable treatment. Well, Dr. An and Kentaro, you, you did not measure the uh, post-implant pressure gradient. So in, in a case with the bicuspid, what is the acceptable final pressure gradient? Because for this case, you did not measure, but... Uh... Okay, we, usually we measured, but uh, this case, I didn't measure, it, and uh, I will follow up this patient on the echo. So, yeah. yeah. Actually, the uh, only step in 320 millimeter has the residual pressure gradient. If the patient has the large body size, yeah. he may have some patient process mismatch. But the, if the patient had the small body size, so usually uh, they doesn't have any uh, patient process mismatch. So, I mean, um, it, does, it, it doesn't take long to do it now if you wanted to. It takes about two seconds. Okay, I agree. Next time I will yeah. measure. All right, well, it's a very, very nice yeah. result. Congratulations, it's very good. Thank you. Thank you. So should we go to the other room now? Yeah, okay. You're on, please. Vinny yeah. and- Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Uh, I'm Yun so Ko from Seoul St. Mary's Hospital. Let me introduce our team. Uh, uh, he's world famous vineyard uh, uh, Bapat and cardiovascular surgeon, and another doctor from Japan, and anesthesiologist and imaging specialist. Uh, this is very beautiful hybrid room, and we are uh, worldwide hot team. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, yes. Introduce so our let's start the case. Okay. Yes. Uh, the case is 82 years old male was admitted to our hospital with this near NYHA function too, and he had a history of multiple myeloma, still on, ongoing chemo, chemotherapy. The echocardiography shows severe degenerative AS with preserved LV function. Next, the STS score is 1.7. Next. <coughs> Echocardiography shows the uh, mean pressure gradient is uh, 58, the uh, aortic uh, valve area 0 0.52. And next, this is the annulus plane. And, uh, uh, this is the CT finding. The uh, annulus short diameter is uh, 23, and annulus long diameter is uh, 32, as well, very elliptical shape. The uh, annulus area is uh, five, seven, eight. Uh, annulus perimeter is uh, eight, eighty-seven. Next, and the sinus valve is uh, enough, and ST junction is, uh, is slightly smaller. Next, and uh, LVLT is okay. There is no problem, and no calcium. Next. Uh, this is calcium dis distribution. Uh, the, the distribution of the calcium is relative <coughs> even the, uh, or three quarts. Uh, the calcium volume is uh, about uh, 400, uh, slightly uh, more than mean calcium volume. Next. 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 Uh, this is three quarts view. Next. Uh, coronary height is uh, no problem. Uh, left coronary height is uh, 16 and right coronary height is 20. Next, uh, this is the uh, sizing sizing table. 
Uh, how about size? So what, which one did you, so are you picking first? Yeah, so we are, we are picking 29. 29. Uh, and I think it falls very nicely in the range. So 29 and the, the uh, actual area was 578? Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So it sounds like it's a 29 and the oversizing would be? 12. Oversizing is 12. 12, yeah. yeah. Next. Next. Okay, the exercise is sufficient. Next. Yeah. And we decide to the uh, Sapiens 3 uh, size the uh, 29 millimeter implantation and access site is right femora. Uh, coronary angiogram is. Uh, would you see the coronary angiogram? This is right coronary is normal. We don't we don't see the we don't see the angiogram. Yeah. Right, yeah. Now we can see it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. This is right coronary and this is left coronary. Excellent. Uh, coronary is no problem. Yep. So I think the main discussion here is 82 with a low STS score. Yeah. Uh, is it a uh, indication for TAVI or is this a patient which will go for surgery? Uh, this patient is very old patient, 82 year old male. The Korean mean life expectancy of man is uh, 78 year old. Uh, he is uh, above the mean life expectancy, and so. Uh, his uh, considering of his life expectancy, the uh, tabi is no problem, I think. Yeah. And plus, the anatomy is very good. Yeah, and so anatomy is very good. There is no high risk feature of risk of coronary obstruction yeah. or LVOT calcium. Yeah. The sizing is, I think, perfect. Uh, if there are any doubts, then it will push us towards surgery. So, Vinny, so Vinny now that you mentioned it, and. Uh, we have Ansel Chung here as well. So would you, would you think that like wh where you practice in Colombia or uh, in, uh, where you used to be in London, this patient would be considered as a potential surgical case? So in, in England, definitely this would go for surgery because he is, although he's a 82, he's a low risk 82, uh, he will go for a mini AVR. In US, in fact, this is very, uh, it's a debatable issue because it all will depend on the frailty. Um, I think the frailty index is very important uh, in this particular patient, which I haven't seen before. So if he is 82 with low STS, uh, but if he's frail, I would go towards TAVI. But if he is uh, 82 with uh, either frail or any high risk feature, I would uh, go towards surgery. Yeah, so he, he has hematology, hematologic malignancy. He's taking hemotherapy as a yeah, so probably it will increase the risk of, of uh, complications after the regular surgery. Yes, um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so that that's important whether he is uh, currently what he is taking and whether it will affect his immunity healing. Uh, you're absolutely right. So I think uh, it's very important that we know the life expectancy of this patient as well. Uh, if it's less than one year because of any malignancy, then uh, it becomes a critical issue. Is this more aortic stenosis or more aortic regurgitation? So we are going to show you some uh, transthoracic echo. Uh, it's a mixed uh, lesion, but mainly calcified, I think, aortic stenosis. Yeah, I mean, you can see the leaflet opening. It's pretty Absolutely. tight. Yeah. Yeah. Means it's a, I'm, I'm quite impressed that we have done, shown four cases today and all four cases have very less calcium than what we see in Europe or US. Would you all agree? Yep. Yeah, and uh, Janier is on the panel. Uh, he has got a large experience of TAVI, uh, including hosts in China. Uh, what I hear is that the Chinese patient tend to have more calcification. Yeah. Um, while here, all four cases, there is less calcification. Not, 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 not to stop you from your work, maybe we can continue to work and then we can yeah. debate that question a bit on the uh, surgery versus uh, TAVR. Because uh, fast forward, assuming that it is just for a second to play around with this, that the, the studies of low risk can come back non-inferiority, then you have to leave it to the patient, right? Okay. to choose okay. or the insurance, the, insurance. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is the magic word 
<laughs> in years. But means if we strictly go by it, he's a low risk patient. So we can't bend the rules both ways. So I think I would justify it if it's frail patient or chemotherapy. Okay. And then so we I think we're just going to show you a quick short axis view before we start. Yeah. Uh, we have already crossed. Can you see the echocardiogram? Yes. Yeah, but yeah. I show you uh, uh -huh. the short axis of LT bar. The echo in is not quite good. Uh, short axis. Uh, yeah, it's, it's hard for us to see 100%. Maybe you can explain what you're, what you're looking for. Uh, we are just trying to demonstrate uh, it's predominantly aortic stenotic lesion. Okay. Uh, so if we go to long axis view and put some color maybe. Uh, we'll this is the short axis view. The imaging is slightly difficult than the first yeah. patient. Yeah. Yes. There. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So okay. Yeah. I think. Yeah, we, 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 yeah. we buy it. Yeah. Yeah. Except, except Horst. Horst. Horst is the only one who is <laughs> not, not sure. Maybe we well, should do sure it under the yeah, yeah. Which is okay. I mean. yeah. Which is, yeah, Pocos there's Pocos calcification. So. Yeah. Mix, yeah, mixed up disease is okay. Mm -hmm. So you cross, it was crossed pretty rapidly. Oh, I need about two minutes. And uh, cross the... <laughs> Very Just good. Wire. Very good. Yeah. So yeah. we are not going to do BAV. Yeah. Yeah. How, how about uh, predilatation? No. No predilatation. Yeah. How about the panelists? Everybody says yeah. no? no. No. Really? We still, <laughs> okay. we still do it. Old dinosaurs. We still do yeah. it. <laughs> I totally agree with you. <laughs> so I think. Uh, the, the Dr. Binya, the paper. Uh, yeah, the so we stopped doing BAV yeah. in St. Thomas yeah. nearly six years ago. So. I think with S3, uh, I think it's not needed. Yeah. AP view. So it's a so 29 S3. Yeah, 29 S3. And it's the large, it's the 16 uh, expandable sheaf. Yeah. Yeah. No problem there? Yeah, no problem. No, it's an 8 millimeter vessel. 8 millimeter so vessel. So there was no issue at all. Yeah, I, I noticed that people are concentrating, I don't know, because it's a live case or not, but we spend a lot of time looking at the, at the femoral access from these CTs yes. as much as the cardiac components. Absolutely. Okay, very is out. I'm just going to align the valve. Yeah, why are you to say? Vinny, have you done the pre-mounted S3 already, or it hasn't been, it didn't make it to the show no, yet? Uh, not yet. I think the trial in Europe is just about to start. It's a registry, if I'm correct, for 20 patients. Yeah. And uh, that's the Sapien Ultra. Yeah. And uh, then it will be uh, released in US. So and this step will be uh, not yeah, needed? This step won't be needed. Yeah. So you go and, in and, and go and with the it. the sheath is different as well. Yeah. So... I can do it for you if you want. So, okay. Attribute. Yeah, so we have crossed it beautifully in the center, I think. We are slightly low. Yeah. Yep, yep. Yeah. Looking good. Maybe a bit high. Yeah. That's okay. So we are going to demonstrate uh, two-stage yeah. inflation. Yeah. Uh, we will perform the two-stage implantation. Uh, first implantation is very shallow, and then the, the position of valve is okay. There is full dilatation of valve. The second stage, the implantation. Isn't that okay? too high? Yeah. Yes, we're slightly yeah. high. So we're just going to... Yeah, there. Yeah. Perfect. Enjoy. Yeah. Enjoy. Only, only enjoy. Yeah. I think this is very good. Yeah. The push, how about the position? That's good. Looking good. Yeah, that's very good. 
Yep. Okay. So pick till yeah. back. Yeah. Yes. And uh, slide after, click. After. Okay. Yeah. Page on. Page on. Angel. Balloon. Okay. Yeah, full balloon. So that looks okay. good. So yep. again, it's we have actually slightly high. One, two, three. Yeah, fishing up. So this is Morris. Uh, you were saying is ninety ten, I think. Yep. So I'm, kind of, a, I'm, I'm kind of a fan place. of the 90-10 as long as your coronary height is okay. Yep. And so here it was 16 yep. and 20. So my, my impression also it helps with the pacemaker. Yes. Yeah. Of course. Okay. Enjoy this. Okay. Enjoy. So excellent. Yeah. Pleasure. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. How about echo? Yeah. yeah. You see both coronaries flowing. Yeah, yeah. Coronary is okay. And 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 the wire is still there. And despite that, a trickle of AI probably get better as mm. you get yeah. the wire out. Well done. Yeah. So wire we out. heard your discussion in the previous case about uh, positioning wire. of wire. S3. Wire. So wire. Uh, even if it's biker speed, I think our aim is to align the top of the S3 okay. to cover the leaflets. Yep. Uh, so that we apply in tricuspid as well as bicuspid so that the valve doesn't end below the leaflet. So in a way, super slightly above the annular plane. Yes. <coughs> yeah, I think that, that seems to have worked well at the, in the true bicuspid where the AR is an issue. But they did it how they did it and it ended up perfect in a very nice very result. Right. Yes, yeah. indeed. Uh, Echocoderm just shows it's a very good result. Dr. Kim, how about the... Uh, uh, yeah, but I, I'm looking at yeah, the parabolic. I, I also have to evaluate in apical view. Wait a minute. So because the S3 is a tall device, I think measuring STJ is yeah. quite important. Yeah, quite important. And uh, if the STJ is slightly narrow, we probably would have placed this slightly okay. lower. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, is this that the common practice in the panel? Yeah. Uh, uh, anyway, I think um, we, we, we agree with you. But this is a good view here for the TTE. And you could see. Yeah. No <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> no regards. I think it's just that uh, Echo shows uh, only uh, trace uh, power case and yeah. many central yeah. AR. It's yeah. mostly, yeah, I would say mixed of the two, but uh, both of them are trace. So the yeah. wire yes. needs to come out until you make your final angel. We usually yep. turn the color off, then the AR disappears. Yep. Yep. So, <laughs> so. Yeah, final angel. Okay. So, why is out? Angel. Oh. Yeah, I think it's the beat, probably more than anything. So mm. There's a tiny regurge, I think. Yeah, it's a little, 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 it's yeah. a little bit yeah. more yeah. than uh, trace. Thought. Yeah, more than trace. Uh, so, options here include uh, post dilatation. Uh, how I about your opinion? <laughs> let's just let just wait. Let's look at the echo again and uh, or take another. It's kidney function, okay? Yes, so, function. Okay. Yeah. So, so I don't know the the rest of the host and everybody else. Please chime in. But you know, you have this sometimes discordance between what the echo sees and how we know that the echo is very dependent yeah. on the plane of capture versus the angel. How do you decide which one is right? Personally, I... Diastolic pressure on the aorta is echo. 40, <laughs> yes. right? Is that 40? I, yeah, always don't, I don't like leaving it with when the angel doesn't look like... Yes. Angel is, is always... 50. So sometimes it's a confusion. So yeah, if you decide that, uh, okay, it looks like uh, some... More, uh, se more severe the parabellar leakage and uh, most of the, the intervention to uh, the fix it uh, okay but the, in some rare cases more intervention makes uh, some injury 
Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, the, we the have to do the establish the, some consensus. But don't you think that this, at least angiographically, this is more than one plus? This is more going on the mild to moderate. Could, or could this, mild plus, no? Could this be due to the If you have some the, uh, uh, I doubt so. about it, I mean, let, let's do uh, the accurately transesophageal echo and uh, the consult uh, the, the... No, I mean... So I you mean, prefer I mean, a transesophageal echo versus a one balloon dilatation? You think the risk is, is greater? I, I prefer <laughs> that, yeah. Um, you know what? I, I, I think the, big, the pigtail is probably too low. If we rotate yes. that pigtail and then So do can we, maybe we can take, that's why one more injection, just yeah, uh, yeah. if we take yeah. the pigtail slightly high. Yeah, and, yeah uh, but don't take it, but don't take it, to, but don't take it to the descending aorta. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> Morris, Morris, uh, I, have a, I have a different uh, opinion. The, uh, the uh, other alternative okay. is that the major, the, the LB uh, and diastole pressure. Yes. I, I would so, say pro precaution to do a redilatation on this patient. The, the reason you look at the aortogram is that the, the stress is really against the aorta. So in this yeah. case, I will not do the uh, 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 redilatation on this patient. Particularly, I think the leak is pretty, pretty trivial. I think you do the, the stand is already attached to the aortic wall. You look at the aortogram. So in that <laughs> case, I will not do it. Yeah, and I think yeah. the other thing is, uh, let's, let's do one more angio because this is an important decision. Yeah. Patient had mm -hmm. some AI before, so we may not do a disservice by leaving a mild AI behind. Yeah. Uh, so let's just do another angio. Yeah. If the, okay. uh, this kind of the uh, angiographic finding in the aortogram in the, the bicuspid aortic belt, so the yeah, okay, here, maybe, so we will I think it's okay. Yeah. Maybe uh, the related with uh, the some complications, so. I think he, said he did a great job, uh, just let yeah. it alone. I, so, you know. I, I think this looks okay to me. I think many times you see the jet hitting the anterior mitral leaflet and then widening as a, as we call it, a waterfall jet. So I think this should be okay. We'll just do a transthoracic echo detail. Yeah. And if there is any worry, we'll cross and uh, do, do another dilatation with 2cc more. But I think we should just check the transthoracic properly before we do that. Okay, that sounds good. Yeah. Why, why not check the uh, uh, diastolic index? We should do that. Diastolic so index? We can, we'll just swap the wire yes. and get a yeah. picture. Yeah. So do you, do you really pop the wire here? Or let's, let's talk out? about this a little bit. Sometimes you just advance the, this pigtail okay. and it just crosses. Yep. As I usually, I decide the post take post dilatation uh, uh, according to the echo finding, that angel finding. Uh, okay. What was the diastolic aortic pressure before? I think it was similar. Similar. Yeah. Similar. Similar. Yeah. Device off. But another argument to post dilate is you can see that on the left side the device is um, uh, longer than the yes. uh, right side. So it will definitely shorten if we post dilate. Yep. And maybe that is probably the best solution. Yep. That, so that's, that's a good observation. Yeah. Actually. Yep. Yes. Yeah. You can see it right there from the still frame. Yeah. Yes. You just set it and here it is. It, it tends to catch on the calcium and then yep. it stops for shortening. Mm -hmm. So I think we can do that. We are going to cross the valve so we can always uh, come back and do post dilatation. Yeah, that, the LVEDP seems to be a good idea. Yeah. yeah. I, I've gotten used to the TEE, so it's, uh, <laughs> it helps a great deal. <laughs> What about uh, the uh, transthoracic uh, echocardiography finding for the occurrence of the, some minimal uh, pericardial effusion? If there oh, is you a mean pericardial the presence of pericardial effusion? We can have a look, but uh, are you, I mean, we are not worried about it at present. There, there are no high risk features mm. for annular rupture here or perforation, so we haven't observed hemodynamic yeah. instability. Yeah, pressure the fluid. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Here it is. So, yes. LV looks good, uh, no effusion. Uh, no effusion. No effusion. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. 
So we'll see the, what the LVDP is. Please show us uh, the RV. RV is uh, the compressed or not the. Well, you, you see it effusion? A little bit. No. no. Okay. I don't know what others feel. I, I try not to uh, do the probing too much, and with the pigtail, just sometimes pigtail. it just yeah. goes by itself. You, you yeah, study so the pigtail, and it just slips yeah, in. Yeah. And uh, doing the manipulation after yes. this, and trying Yes, uh, it no, actually, I'm you're right. Especially, one more. yeah, with the, I usually uh, stiffen the pigtail with a little bit of a wire without having it all the way extruding, and just push it a little Should, bit, and it goes. Uh, we can change this uh, with the pigtail. Yeah. Probing a little bit makes you nervous. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And not only that, means if it goes outside the valve, it becomes a bigger issue. Exactly. And uh, this has this and happens has, once in a while. It has and happened. Yes, it's it not has unheard happened. of. And uh, it's very hard to check on TTE mm. that you have gone through the middle or on the side. Yep. You are in a rush. Yep. And then it leads to a much bigger issue. Precisely. And then you should not post dilate, right? Yes, so I think what, if we yeah. cross easily with a pigtail, uh, then we'll check on TTE <coughs> that we are through the valve. Um, if there is any doubt, especially if there is a much bigger leak, what we tend to do mm -hmm. is uh, we use the BAV balloon, uh, make sure that it goes easily because you can see it better, and then only attempt anything heroic. So you're looking at a rise of the LVEDP compared to baseline, and your baseline was, you said, 7. Uh, I can't remember now the reading, okay. but I think we can come back to that. Yeah. Not simple pushing, a little bit the rotation. Yeah. And pushing. You caught it. Great. <laughs> hmm. so it's starting to look like a surgical valve, really. I would have finished an open heart by now, I think. <laughs> I'm just joking. Yeah. No, I think, uh, but this is important discussion. And this is very important, not just for beginners, but for all of us, is when we do minimalistic approach, what is the best way to satisfy ourselves that we are going to leave minimal AI? And I would like to listen to all your views on which different ways uh, you make sure that patient doesn't leave with more AI than acceptable. Do you think that this really need a retiration and echo how much your regurgitation there? I didn't see any really regurgit parallel regurgitation on the echo. Yes, yes. Right. I think you're right. I think we're going to probably just if we don't cross, we are going to leave it. Because it seems like the overwhelming uh, majority of yeah. the panelists uh, are with you. Yeah. There's so only, we, only one, one to, or two minor. We are going to stop. He's, uh, as we discussed, That's he's good. Mm. 82. It's a, I would say, a, a, a very good result. And yes. I think if we try to do more, we might cause more damage. Yeah. So <laughs> yep. I think we Certainly should good. be uh, quite happy with that. And uh, as someone in the panel suggested, uh, if we are worried, we can always check with a better echo yeah. at later stage and then uh, address the AI if necessary. Sure. Well, thank you very much for this demonstration, discussion. It was very, very instructive. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right, so uh, we're going to sign out now from the cath lab, and maybe we can start. Uh, I don't know if uh, Greg is here. Uh, I don't see him yet. We are ahead of schedule. Uh, baby horse can, and then I see uh, David here. Oh, no. No. No, the next one. You gotta go back. And, uh, I could try. I mean, but uh, <laughs> okay. Transcatheter tricuspid valve repair and implantation. 
what can cause tricuspid regurg? Primary TR, and that is Epstein, myxomatous, cartsunate disease, endomyocardial fibrosis, rheumatic endocarditis, and traumatic and pacemaker leads, very important actually. And then secondary TR, and that is left heart failure, pulmonary hypertension, and RV dysfunction, and as well as AG fibrillation. So actually, this is the, ma the major causes of uh, tricuspid regurg, and actually out of these left heart failure and pulmonary hypertension are really the most important ones. That is more than 90% of all TR. When you look at different patient populations like mitroclip, post mitroclip, TAVI, TAVI, SARA, and so on, and you look how many of them have moderate to severe tricuspid regurg, you can see numbers here in different trials between uh, 6 and 21%. Uh, the anatomic changes in functional TR, the septum is, as you know, in a fixed position, therefore the annulus dilates on the side of the free wall, and RV dilatation causes further annular dilatation, and this causes increasing TR and worsened RV overload and dilatation. What are the clinical symptoms? That's not so clear, but many of these patients have actually low output failure, fatigue, reduced exercise capacity, and then, of course, congestion, peripheral edema, ascites, hepatomegaly, cirrhosis, low appetite, as well as crachexia, and atrial fibrillation. What is the prognosis of tricuspid insufficiency? Well, this is a study in patients with chronic left heart failure, 576 patients, and you can see that the prognosis largely depends upon the presence of TR. These are the patients who do not have severe moderate TR, and these are those patients with moderate to severe TR, and you can see the difference in uh, the combined endpoint, which was death, heart transplantation, and left ventricular assist device. TR is not reversible in most of these patients. Usually it does not go away after mitral valve repair, and this is a study from 2004, for more than 5,000 patients. 16% of these patients had severe TR before, and that discharge, 62% uh, still had severe TR. These are the transcatheter tricuspid repair and replacement techniques, and I will go through this. Actually, the first technique which has been used to repair a valve in tricuspid position uh, was uh, many years ago in 2010 was the procedure published in 2011 by Olaf Franzen, and this is one of our cases before, and this is two months after CLIP, so you can achieve really good results in some of these patients, but obviously not in all of them. The former is a different approach, it's a kind of a, uh, 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 on a rail which is anchored in the right ventricle and then the space is introduced over this rail so it basically occupies the space between the leaflets without really uh, touching them and this uh, does not reduce the uh, orifice area but the functional orifice area of the tricuspid valve is narrowed by this spacer. The Mistral device is a kind of a spiral which is introduced into the space below the tricuspid valve and then it's turned around and by doing so you bring the cordae of the tricuspid valve more close together. Then we have the mitral line which is now used in the tricuspid position. This technique basically replicates a surgical procedure, the K procedure. It converts an incompetent tricuspid into a competent bicuspid valve. These are surgical cases here where pledges are applied and the same is done with catheter techniques. This is the device, this is the handle which is used to implement these sutures. It seems to be a very cheap procedure but we will see how this goes. Fortec is a different approach where an anchor is uh, adjusted in, or anchored in the annulus of the tricuspid valve and then tension is applied and this uh, suture or cord is fixed to a stent which is implanted in the inferior vena cava and this uh, is really a very effective uh, uh, procedure in selected patients as you can see here. They have now recently modified the uh, anchoring technique. This was a screw initially and we had some patients where this screw came off out of the myocardium and now we are using a different technique where this anchor is introduced into the pericardial space which gives much more security regarding stability. The tripta technique is a, a technique which sounds a little bit weird. It's an, you perform a right atrial appendage puncture and get pericardial access. 
Then a circumferential implant is delivered along the atrioventricular groove, and then tension is adjusted, and then the, at the end, the uh, right atrial puncture hole is closed with an umbrella closure device. Millipede is a, a system which was originally developed for the mitral valve, but it has been used in tricuspid position in two patients. It's a transfemoral delivery system. It's a semi-rigid, adjustable, complete ring. And then we have the cardioband TR, which is a, a, the similar technique like for the mitral valve. And uh, it's the same implant and delivery system. And a couple of cases have uh, been done with this system. Then we have cable valve implants. Uh, that means you implant a valve, a self expandable valve in the uh, SVC, and then a second valve in the also self expandable in the IVC at the cable atrial junction above the hepatic vein inflow. Then we have valve in surgical valve. I will skip this because it's really a special indication, mostly in congenital heart disease. And finally, we have the tricuspid valve implantation. This is the Navigate system, which uh, was initially used by Samir Kapadia. You can see really big valves, up to 58 is now the largest valve. This was the first case uh, done in our institution. This is before, this is after implantation of this valve, because you need a very big introducer sheath. Most of these cases have been done by a direct transatrial access. So like in mitral position, we will need different repair techniques for different morphologies, maybe in combination. Imaging is even more complex and even more important than in most other interventions, including mitral. Current results of repair are promising, but not optimal yet, and tricuspid valve implantation has taken off. Thank you very much for your attention. So, Horst, we have a couple of minutes because we are running ahead of schedule, uh, and I don't see Greg, so next maybe would be uh, David, but uh, what, what do you think of these uh, you went through very quickly. Uh, is there anything that gives you an impression which of those devices is more advanced? Do you think the mitre clip uh, is going to be uh, effective enough? What, what's your thought about with all these With all these techniques, we have only very few patients who have really complete resolution of the TR. That means many of them are going from tremendous TR to severe TR, and they still have some clinical improvement, but we are really far away from surgical results, with the exception, of course, of the uh, valve implantation, which is currently in a very early stage. And very large device. Very large device, and, and we have to do a, a mini thoracotomy and right yeah. atrial access. So my, my initial question was a little bit leading the witness, the beginning of what, what is it? So now that we know that resolution is going to be difficult, and going from severe to, uh, or torrential to severe, is what we have. What's wrong with the simpler concept of the tricavity thing, where you basically transform the atrium into the ventricularized atrium and then protect the body? Well, isn't that probably, the, if, if technically possible, isn't that the simplest? You may know that it was recently, I think it was a randomized trial, actually with 30 patients, which was negative. So it looks like that it's not so easy as we thought. And that is probably because you still have a, a huge uh, TR going into the right atrium. So there's still a loss of blood in the view of the heart. So I think this is not the ideal approach. Anybody has uh, comments, question? I know that uh, you guys were working with spacers in the mitral. What do you think of the former? Uh, former, I don't think it will be resolved, that, that uh, leakage, but, uh, but it's simple, very simple. It could be a day procedure like a pacemaker. So I think for the, for the very high risk patient, I think for the symptomatic relief, I think there's a role, because it's so easy to do, and the very low risk of the procedure. So there was a, a first, first in man, I guess, that had to be stopped and started. Uh, what were the results there? Did you, was it going from torrential to severe or better than that? Uh, you should depend on that right now, because when we started, only one size is the space, the diameter, because the diameter is very important. We based on the measurement of the, the regurgitant jet area, and that's very critical, and then you select the size. Uh, now we have a two-size balloon, 
So I think an increase the size balloon, I think it will be better, better outcome. If, the, if your measurement is accurate and the balloon size selected well, I think it will reduce the significant. But we have a, actually we have a one retrieval because of, uh, the balloon is too small. So we have to insert another one, a bigger one. So, so that's a, I think that as a one is the measurement is critical, is the area, and the second is the balloon size. I think it's very important. Otherwise, uh, thank you. Uh, so, uh, David, uh, please uh, we'll invite you to come in and uh, talk about the uh, Watchman device for left atrial appendage closure, data synthesis, and ongoing trials. Welcome, David, again. I should have introduced you as the master of masters, my apologies. <laughs> it's great to be here in a room like this, talking about Watchman data synthesis and ongoing trials. In two th I've been talking about left atrial appendage occlusion things for a long time. In 2002, this is an interesting picture. It's from the ESC meeting in 2002. At that point in time, I was asked to speak about left atrial appendage occlusion. This was the room that I was given. In this room, there was room for myself. We were still doing slides, and so there was a slide projector there. I had an elderly aunt who, was, who lived in Europe, and she came, and that was it. So there has been a transition since that room in 2002 where I think there is more interest to now a larger room with more people. At that point in time, when I began to talk about left atrial appendage closure, and Maurice would have been part and Horst would have been part of the discussion, at the end of each subject talk, we would say, as we were young parents at that point in time, and some of the time we took our kids on a trip, and in the trip when we got close, we heard a whiny voice in the background, and the kid would say, are we there yet? I gotta go to the bathroom. And you then, as a parent, would say, for the last time, we are not there yet. And so for each talk in that closet at ESC, we would say, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. Let's talk then about what has happened since that time, since 2002. And so we're going to then talk about big, bigger data, which is terribly interesting in a very big field that, as we talked about this morning, turns out to be an annuity plan for interventional cardiologists. You're going to say, why do we need more data? There are several different things as we think about the foundation upon which we do science. We're always adding more data. These are some of the reasons in this particular space that we would not, not need more data. Well, the device landscape changes. There are going to be new devices. We've seen about new TAVR devices and new tricuspid valve devices. There are going to be new devices. Some of those are going to be improved initial device designs. So you had an initial device, it didn't work, and so you changed it. Other designs are going to be totally different, and so we would need more data for that. We might need more data because the targets have changed. For example, these would be patients that hadn't been treated before. In the early days of Watchman and left atrial appendage closure devices, people stayed away from those patients that had end-stage chronic kidney disease. They were excluded. Or those patients that had an intracerebral hemorrhage. We excluded those patients, and so since that time, we might need more data because the targets have changed. The next group of reasons that we might think about having more data is that there are new targets now in terms of hybrid procedures. We now have TAVR, 
left atrial appendage devices. We have MitraClip that is being used combined with left atrial appendage. And we have pulmonary vein isolation, which is a real big deal that is now part sometimes of left atrial appendage occlusion devices. There might be other reasons why we need more data. Well, we might need more data because we now have alternative therapy changes like NOACs. We need to remember that the Watchman devices did not use NOACs because when the Watchman devices started in 2002, we weren't exactly sure even how to spell NOACs or what they meant because they weren't around and they weren't used. Or we might need it because there's new information of feet of clay. We've now started to hear about device-associated thrombus. We've started to hear about residual leak. We're going to need more data on those specific topics. And finally, we might need more data because the concepts change. For example, there is recent data to suggest that the left atrial appendage is not simply sort of an appendix that you don't need anymore when you're growing old that indeed the left atrial appendage might be important for homeostasis and it might be important for atrial fibrillation either induction or maintenance and so we're going to need more data in these groups to assess the issues of left atrial appendage occlusion. Why do we focus so much on it? Well, we focus because it's a huge disease, number one. Uh, estimated that there will be 30 million patients in the United States having the disease by the year 2050. That's a lot of patients. That's a lot of room that we have to grow into that patient space. We know that strokes have higher mortality and morbidity. We have know that 15 to 20 percent of atrial fibrillation strokes are fatal. We know that they have high recurrence rates and the cost of treatment and the cost of prevention. And so we need more data because it is a huge population of patients that we can potentially treat. I've been asked to talk about the Watchman device. That's the only approved device in the United States. It's probably going to be the only approved device in the United States for at least a little bit, maybe one or two years. But this is the information that we have. And we have an increasing amount of data. We have a more complete data set. We have Protect AF and CAP and Prevail. And you can read the rest of these. And they move on to Evolution and WASP, ASAP2 and Nested SAP and Pinnacle and PROG17 and Salute or Salute. And so there are a whole series of clinical trials that we need to at least mention going forward for this talk. I need to remember, and I'm very, very familiar with the fact that I'm the only person between you and dinner. So we're going to move right along. So we have a couple pieces of information. We have now longer term data on the only two randomized clinical trials we have, Protect AF and Prevail, and we now have five-year data. We never had any data before. We now have five-year data. And we can say, looking at that, if we were to say what looks at Watchman versus what looks at Warfarin, we can see that efficacy, it's pretty much spot on. We can see all stroke or systemic embolism is spot on. That means either that indeed not all strokes are related to the left atrial appendage or there are issues with how we do those procedures that might cause stroke. And indeed, that is probably the case, that indeed we may cause some strokes or have in the past caused strokes related to the procedure itself. But the most important parts of this deal with the fact that at five years, hemorrhagic stroke has decreased by 80%. There are not very many things in the interventional field that decrease anything by 80%. And indeed, then, if you were to look at cardiovascular unexplained death in this group of patients out to five years, and it's good data, it reduces cardiovascular or unexplained death by 40%. Again, there are very few things in interventional cardiology that reduce an event, a bad event, by 40%. 
So that's the five-year data of randomized trials. What about the new stuff? Since the device has been approved in the United States, there is a nested wedge watchman study. It was mandated by the FDA. It's a prospective study of newly implanted watchman devices looking at all stroke or systemic embolism or cardiovascular unexplained death. It's going to be 2,000 patients and it's ongoing and we're going to follow these patients out to two to five years. These studies increasingly are going to require longer and longer and longer follow-up. So every year you're going to have the potential to see different iterations of the same sort of data. What do we know about this data in this nested SAP registry looking at the safety from protect and prevail to now this nested pass registry, we can see that the safety primary endpoint is improved. It is proved that it now meets the goal for being very, very safe technology. The next piece of information is to say, well, we have a study, at least in the United States and around the world, that's called ASAP2, and Maurice is part of that that evaluates left atrial closure with watchmen in patients who cannot take oral anticoagulants. It's a study that's very, very hard to enroll, but it is going reasonably well, and Maurice might be able to tell us about that. So that at the end of time, we'll be able to know whether we can use this technology in somebody that you either choose not to or chose not to use anticoagulation. Next piece of information is to say for the very first time in this field, we have a head-to-head -head comparison of the Watchman device versus the Amulet's, Am Amplats or Amulet device. It's a study that's ongoing that will compare 1,600 patients who were randomized between the Amulet device and the Watchman device. It has enrolled about 1,000 patients. It's going to be a couple of years, probably the end of 2020, before we have the data on that. But that will be for the very first time in this field, a randomized trial head-to-head -head between two different devices that we will need to make important decisions. Next piece of information is to say, well, are we finding some things along the way that make you a little nervous? We've talked about device-to-device -device comparisons. We've talked about long-term follow-up. Are some things have happened that we weren't sure we were going to see? This is data from the Evolution trial from Europe, looking at two-year follow-up, 835 patients with left atrial appendage imaging, and they found possible thrombus in 4.1%. We're going to have to decide, is that a big deal? Do we have to address that? There's been a recent Jack article that said, well, maybe we do have to address it. It's a small number of patients, that is true. But it may need to be addressed in larger trial sets going forward. We do know that in evolution at two years, Patients do very well if they have a low CHADS 2 VASC score, their incidence of event is zero, zip. And so whether they have thrombus on the device or not doesn't seem to matter. But in other patient groups, they are associated with increased event rates, and Horst has studied that in other devices. Next piece of information is to say, well, there are other places in the world that are studying this. This happens to be in a Chinese population called WASP in patients that receive the device greater than three months after stroke or transient ischemic attack with the primary endpoint of all stroke or systemic embolism or cardiovascular death. It's going to be a couple of years before we get the data. But this is the one-year data that we have. If you were to look at ischemic stroke or transient ischemic attack or major bleeding, the expected rate and the observed rate in this registry study, it's about 80% less in terms of ischemic stroke than the expected rate based upon the chance 2 vasc score. And the HASBLAD score is 50% less. And it makes sense that it improves outcome in that way. Is there a difference in that study between non-Asians and Asians? Well, they look about the same. 
they look about the same in terms of ischemic stroke reduction and major bleeding, whether they're Asians or non-Asians. This technology works. Next piece of information is to say how about the salute. This happens to be a Japanese study, non-valve atrial fibrillation, 54 subjects, and this is the scheme of the study from informed consent out to two years to look at how it's doing in Japanese study in a single armed group. And this is the salute subject enrollment. You can see it's a small study. Enrollment is attempted and implanted and then the roll in number, small numbers of patients. But when we look at, we can see there are no implant failures. We're getting better. There are no deaths out to six months and no patients withdrawn after six months. And their primary first endpoint says that it's better than anything else we've seen. Japanese do chronic total occlusions. Chronic total occlusions are done by Koreans better than anybody else. Well, maybe they do Watchman devices better than anybody else. And if you were to look at the composite of, during the six month of the secondary primary end, endpoints, they are very, very low. Zero hemorrhagic stroke, zero systemic embolism, zero cardiovascular death or unexplained death. And so what then could we say about summary? Multiple trials complete and results demonstrate safety and efficacy of the Watchman device. It's safe in the hands of new and experienced operators. There aren't any significant differences in ischemic stroke rates versus warfarin, superior reduction in disabling strokes. There have been two trials in Asian subpopulations, and there are other current trials evaluating post-implant medications. There's a Korean trial that you may, may, may or may not know about. There's another Chinese multi-center trial that looks at Watchman versus Rivaroxaban. There's a Royal Brompton trial looking at left atrial appendage electrical isolation along with a Watchman device. And the Swedish trial and a Maastricht trial. So there's a huge amount of data that we will see going forward to expand upon the initial protect and prevail trial. And the final piece of information is to say, well, it's not the same device as it was in 2002. We now have the Flex device that is being tested in this United States, as well as in Europe, and then will be in the Far East that has a different look to it that presumably is going to be safer. It's going to allow recapture easier. It's going to be better for sealing residual leaks. So we then talked about the background, the clinical trial timelines. We've talked about the fact that the very early, early experience in 2002 was held in a room that was the size of a closet. We said at that point in time that there were, we were not there yet. If we were to look forward now to 2018, the difference between 2002 and 2018 is rather than being able to say, for the last time, we are not there yet. We're there. We've got data on the Watchman and other left atrial appendage closure devices that allow you to use this technology, this transformative technology, to optimize the care of large number of patients. It's an incredibly interesting growing field and we will have increasing data upon which to base incredibly important objective conclusions. Thank you. David, uh, we have a couple of minutes. To, I think that uh, we, we're ahead of schedule and Greg just showed up. So uh, it, it's are we there yet or are we not there yet is, a, is an important question because in my mind, we may never be there. And the reason is because if we are trying to get this uh, left atrial appendage closure field where it needs to be, meaning perhaps as an alternative to oral anticoagulation, the medical therapy arm still keeps moving from Coumadin to Noax to who knows what next. But importantly, the devices keep changing. They become easier, maybe safer. So how do, you, how do you make up with all this in terms of this ever ongoing next and next step? Sure. 
I think the analogy of that is the electrophysiology anatomy. For those of you that came along early on the field of um, WPW sort of um, ablation approaches, you would remember very early on patients had to fail everything. They had to fail everything. And finally, after they had failed everything, you said, well, we've got something else. We could uh, take care of it today. Do you have anything on your schedule for later on this afternoon? We could take care of it. And that then led to guidelines that now say that electrical isolation for wolf Parkinson white syndrome is primary care. I think we will see that for some cases in some patients when we see cabana, that we're gonna say we no longer need to have failed everything before we have this type of technology which takes care of everything. And that will then lead undoubtedly to the fact that we'll be able to sit down with the patient in the room and say we have two different options. We have a medication that you can use for the rest of your life or you can try to use for the rest of your life. Or we have something that later on today we could use that's just as effective as that medication, but you didn't have to take the medication. And so the patients then will be in the driver's seat to be able to say, gosh, I don't mind medications. Or some other patients are gonna say, why don't we go for it? I don't have anything planned for the rest of the day, let's go for it. So to put you on the spot, since you are the master of masters, does a trial against NOAC, is that a, a definitive yes, maybe, or not needed? I think it's, um, I think it's important. And that's not a dodge, because there are going to continue to be people that say, NOACs are the best thing ever, we should use them all the time, despite the fact that at a median of 1.1 years, 50% of the patients don't take them anymore. That will answer that question that indeed we have needed to answer, that we will be able to compare devices versus NOACs. It's of interest that the FLEX um, trial, when it comes along, will have rivaroxaban rather than warfarin for it. So I think it's going to be uh, neither maybe, I think it's going to be important so that we fill out the, the dance card of options available for patients um, okay. with atrial fibrillation at risk for stroke. Thank you, thank you so much for this uh, excellent overview. Uh, it's my pleasure to ask Greg to come up and discuss for us uh, the clinical trials where we are for functional MR. Thanks. You guys are a half an hour ahead in this room. We were half an hour behind in my room. Yeah. So, uh, so we figured it out. Okay. <laughs> so clinical trials and functional mitral regurgitation. So we always say that functional or secondary mitral regurgitation is a situation that exists when you've got left ventricular, either global or regional dilatation, usually in patients with heart failure. So the disease is the left ventricle. And what that does is you get apical and lateral distraction of the papillary muscles, which tethers open the mitral leaflets, keeps them from co-apting, and causes secondary mitral regurgitation. You can also get it from atrial fibrillation with primary annular dilatation, but most common, the disease is the left ventricle. And this can occur primarily with either ischemic cardiomyopathy, uh, often with posterior myocardial infarction, or idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy. So, where it's very clear that for primary mitral regurgitation, degenerative MR, fixing the valve cures the problem, the real question here is if you fix secondary MR and leave the underlying ventricular dysfunction alone, will you improve the prognosis for the patient? So the pathogenesis is global or regional LV dysfunction causes LV dilatation, that causes mitral leaflet tethering, you get MR. But that increases LV volume overload, increases LV dilatation, that'll worsen tethering in MR, and so you get this vicious cycle. So the question the question is, if you interrupt the vicious cycle, can you improve the prognosis? So you all know about the mitral clip system that creates the uh, double orifice uh, um, alfieri stitch. You get a butterfly type effect. It reduces MR. Uh, it was, uh, to date, 
best tested in the randomized Everest 2 trial. This was a relatively small trial, 279 patients, in patients who were at low risk because they were all surgical candidates. Um, and these were patients in which 73% had degenerative MR and 27% had secondary or functional MR. So this was before we even realized that these two diseases, that is primary and secondary MR, are so different that they should be studied in totally different trials with different comparators. But nonetheless, these low-risk patients in the early stage of our technical expertise with the MitraClip was randomized two to one to the MitraClip versus the control group. And as you all know, this was a negative randomized trial. While the MitraClip was surely safer than surgery, it was not as effective, especially because there was a higher rate of recurrent MR and the need for mitral valve surgery or reoperation. In fact, the primary success rate was only about 78%, so we weren't even very good at implanting this device, where now we're closer to 95%. It was interesting, however, that when you looked at all the different subgroups in this failed trial, the group that did the worst was those with primary or degenerative mitral regurgitation, in which surgery was clearly more effective. In contrast, patients with functional MR did as good, or if anything, the point estimate was slightly better than with surgery at both one year and at five years. And this was significant interaction p-values. Now, you can interpret this as being either that the mitroclips is good as surgery, for functional MR or that neither of them work in functional MR because we really don't know that yet. And there's never been a surgical trial that's randomized patients to either medical therapy or um, mitral repair or replacement. So we don't know if surgery is effective. So if you look at the guidelines for patients with chronic symptomatic mitral regurgitation, these are the US and EU guidelines. Primary degenerative MR, very clear. Fix the valve surgically if you can. If the patient's prohibitive risk, then consider the mitral clip. For secondary or functional MR, the only class one guideline is medical therapy and uh, cardiac resynchronization therapy in appropriate patients. Both surgery and transcatheter mitral valve repair are class 2B, something that may be considered in patients who really aren't doing well, but we really don't have a lot of evidence that it's beneficial. Nonetheless, if you look at the way around the world the mitral clip is being used, it's being used mostly in patients with functional mitral regurgitation. And we certainly have a lot of registries that I won't go through now that suggest that those patients feel better at least. We don't know if they live longer, um, and they may have uh, improved quality of life, improved six-minute walk distance, uh, and ventricular um, negative remodeling. Now, we know that functional MR is a bad thing to have. If you have heart failure, as your quantitative degree of uh, MR increases, your mortality clearly goes down, and your heart failure rehospitalization clearly goes down, and this is, again, an independent predictor of an adverse prognosis. But that doesn't mean that fixing it will change the prognosis. We have a few registries that have tried to look at this. Um, probably the most well-known is that from Duke, in which 239 mitroclip patients with severe MR were propensity matched to 239 conservatively treated patients from the Duke Echo Core Lab database. And you can see overall in this propensity-adjusted analysis, there seemed to be lower mortality at one year. Similar in a, uh, a small center with 120 patients, 260 patient uh, propensity match pairs, you saw similar things with better survival and better heart failure rehospitalization from this study out of Italy. So this has led to a series of randomized trials to see if the MitraClip is effective in patients with heart failure and secondary mitral regurgitation. The biggest of these trials I've had the honor to be working with on for about eight years now, with Mike Mack as the co-principal investigator, um, Abbott as the sponsor, and this is the COAP trial in which we've taken 610 patients with um, core lab um, confirmed severe mitral regurgitation, not appropriate for mitral valve surgery, which is almost all patients because this mitral surgery, as I showed you, is not the standard of care, who have appropriate criteria for the mitral clip, and these patients all had to be on maximal guideline-directed tolerated medical therapy. And we randomized them one-to-one -to, -one to either the MitraClip and guideline-directed medical therapy versus medical therapy alone. The primary effectiveness endpoint is recurrent heart failure hospitalizations through two years, analyzed with all patients having at least one year follow-up, and we have a composite primary safety endpoint against a performance goal. So the great thing is it took us four and a half years to enroll this trial. Uh, it was an incredible effort. And what's exciting is that we're going to have the results at TCT this year in uh, September. So uh, it's going to be one of the highlights of the meeting. I hope you can all come. 
That being said, there's actually four different randomized trials of the, of the mitroclip in patients with heart failure and secondary MR. There's the reshape HF2 trial. This is 388 patients um, uh, with even sicker patients than were in COAPT with ejection fractions of 15 to 40 percent, where COAPT was 20 to 50 percent. There's the MITRA FR study of 288 patients in France. This again was a little bit different because they enrolled slightly less sick patients. Now the ERA went down to as low as 20 millimeters squared, where it could be only 30 millimeters squared or above in COAPT and reshape. And they've got a primary endpoint of death or heart failure hospitalization. And then there's the Matterhorn trial, which is a, a smaller study, and they're actually taking low-risk patients with secondary MR and, once again, comparing the mitral clip to mitral valve surgery. So altogether, this is four trials randomizing 1,488 patients with heart failure and secondary MR to the mitral clip versus either guideline-directed medical therapy or mitral valve surgery. And as of a few weeks ago, 1,304 of those patients had been randomized. COAPT and MITRA FR are completely enrolled. COAPT, I told you, will be at TCT this year. MITRA FR, we expect to be at ESC this year. So it's going to be an exciting fall for these two studies. Reshape HF2 is enrolling well now, 330 patients, and Matterhorn is pulling up but is uh, on its way. So the last thing I'll say is that there are certainly other devices, transcatheter mitral valve repair devices, that are being used for functional MR, and two of those have entered pivotal randomized trials. They're both annual plasty devices, the cardiac dimensions Carillon, which actually cinches the coronary sinus to reduce the septal lateral dimension um, and, second, and, and indirectly affect the mitral valve. And then there's the Edwards cardioband, which creates from the left atrial side a uh, posterior partial annual plasty band with cinching very similar to what the surgeons do. And these two studies are both underway with FDA pivotal trials called Carillon and Active. They're both 375 to 400 patient randomized trials, and the FDA has been a little kinder um, to uh, both these companies, seeing how hard it was to enroll COAPT. They're now allowing a combination primary endpoint of clinical uh, um, uh, um, endpoints plus a surrogate endpoints such as improvement in six-minute walk distance, reduction in uh, regurgitant volume, uh, uh, and KCCQ score. And so both of these trials have enrolled just a few patients to date, but at least they have started. So if I was to give you the status of clinical trials for secondary MR, we've learned that patients with left ventricular dysfunction may develop severe secondary MR, which can increase volume overload, decrease forward cardiac output, and worsen heart failure. COAPT and other randomized trials are being performed to determine whether reducing secondary MR improves the prognosis of patients with heart failure, and we're going to know an awful lot more uh, at the end of this year, which I think will really change uh, uh, how we approach patients with heart failure and mitral regurgitation. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Greg, for this tour de force uh, to make it all on time. So maybe we have a couple of minutes. If anybody from the panel would like to ask a question uh, or comment, maybe I can start by asking, uh, do you think that uh, with all these uh, devices and all, will we be ever, what, what, what will happen uh, if COAPT does not meet its endpoints? So a hypothetical, sure. what kind of effect will it have anywhere from neutral yeah. to positive or yeah. negative? Well, I think if it, if, it, if it misses its primary endpoint, uh, the question is, well, is it, did, was it almost positive? Were other surrogate endpoints positive? Was, did patients feel better? Was six-minute walk distance better? But it just missed heart failure hospitalization. Um, is death or heart failure hospitalization, of which there'll be more events, was that positive? Or is it totally negative? If it's totally negative and totally neutral, then we need to understand it. Was that because there wasn't enough MR reduction with the mitral clip or because there was recurrence? Uh, or was it just the hypothesis of fixing MR in patients with left ventricular dysfunction is wrong? And I think depending on the insights we gain from a negative trial, it will totally change what happens to the field. 
Uh, if co-opt is positive, then I think it becomes the standard of care, uh, the mitral clip for most patients with severe secondary uh, MR, and then you're going to need other therapies to compare to co-opt. I don't think those other trials will be able to continue to compare to guideline-directed medical therapy, and that'll have a lot of impact, for example, on transcatheter mitral valve repair. Um, a, a bigger device, a more uh, complicated procedure with higher procedural complication rate, but will be more effective in reducing MR. So there, you're going to have to probably show that you're more effective to be able to accommodate the increased uh, safety complications. So it'll have a big impact on the field. I think so. And, and, and as you just mentioned at the end of, the, of your comment, is the fact that how will it spill over on the replacement? Yeah. Uh, because at the end, one of the conclusion is that either it's a ventricular problem we're not addressing, or it is really not, uh, reg not decreasing the regurgitant functions enough. Right. Uh, and that is a very important way to, to go about them. Uh, and it's going to impact both. Any, any comments? We hope it's not going to, it's going to impact it positively no matter what. I hope what. so. <laughs> I hope so. If not, I'd like to thank you very much Great. for all this excellent work you've done and the panelists and uh, the previous speakers as well as the operators. It was a great session and thank you for the atten attendees to be here. Okay.